Hi, and welcome to our session. Uh, my name is Larry Maggot, and I'm the CEO of ConnectSafely.org, and we're talking about the risks and benefits of AI, generative AI specifically, but AI in a broader sense. And I'm going to be uh, introducing or allowing the speakers to introduce themselves in just a few minutes, but I just want to make a couple of opening remarks that we hear a lot about AI. In fact, it's really the theme in many ways of this IGF, just as with the theme of Google's big developer conference this year and Meta's big developer conference this year, and just about every tech gathering you go to, people are talking about generative AI. And in addition to all the positive things that people are saying, and I might add some of the hype, there are also the naysayers. In fact, even some of the leaders of the GAI industry have talked about it being an existential threat, uh, along with climate change and uh, nuclear war. Uh, strikes me as a bit of an exaggeration, but nevertheless, I literally saw that online, so it must be true, or at least must be true that it was said. Uh, but you know, I've been, in addition to starting an NGO a number of years ago, I've also been a technology journalist since, believe it or not, 1981. I go back a long way. And in my career as a technology journalist, I've seen a handful of what I would call paradigm shifts. Not too many, but every once in a while something big comes along, like the graphical user interface on a computer, the World Wide Web, broadband, the iPhone, and then of course other similar phones like the Android phones. You can really count them on a couple of hands, major, major shifts in how we are talking about technology. And certainly generative AI, generative AI is among them in my opinion. Uh, I have never seen a paradigm shift get as much attention as quickly as this has. Usually it takes a while, right? You know, somebody comes up with broadband and then it gradually gets better and better and rolls out and it takes years before it becomes anything close to critical mass. And the same was true even when the iPhone was introduced. I mean, it was not a bestseller uh, the year it came out, but eventually became a major product. And that's generally true. And it, in some ways, it's probably going to be true with GAI, although it got off to an extremely fast start with the launch of ChatGTP just a few, really just a few months ago, followed very quickly by Microsoft Bing and Google Bard and other uh, consumer-facing GAI products. Now, when you think about new technologies, there's always concern, and there's good reason to be concerned. I think it if Henry Ford and others in the early automobile industry had had a conversation, had gone to a meeting like this and talked about the future of the automobile in terms of safety and its impact on cities and its impact on the environment, maybe the automobile, as great as it's been, wouldn't have had the harms, the unintended consequences that it's had, or at least maybe not as many, had they given a thought, as much thought to uh, that particular invention as we are giving to GAI. But as far as I know from the history of the automobile, they didn't put this depth of thought into it. But the other thing is the moral panic that emerges with any new technology. In, 19, in 1888, when Kodak introduced the first handheld camera, there was this great fear that this new invention was going to destroy privacy as we know it. Well, it probably did have a negative impact on privacy on some levels, but life went on. And it's almost quaint to think back to the negative impact of the brownie camera when we think about the privacy issues that we're struggling with today. And I don't think that you can blame Kodak for where we are today. And I also don't think that the moral panic around the camera was fully justified, but it existed. And that moral panic has been around almost every new technology and every paradigm shift. I'm reminded to around 2004 when MySpace, the first popular social networking platform became available and there was predator panic. 49 attorneys generals from around the country were making statements about how dangerous this was. There was a television show every week on NBC, one of America's largest television networks, called To Catch a Predator. And it was mostly about internet predators, as if you couldn't go online without a high probability of being molested if you were a child. And while that was and continues to be a serious risk, it is statistically unlikely, at least for the vast majority of young people online, but there was an enormous attention paid to it until there was research and experience and perspective, and we began to put that in perspective with all the other risks. And again, it's not an, it, it is a risk, but it's a risk that we have, we have now a much better understanding on. So as we talk about generative AI in terms of both the risks and benefits, we need to put in perspective that A, there's a lot we don't know, and B, 
the history of technologies suggests that we will find a way to come to grips with it and live with it, and yes, it will have some negative consequences, but it will also have some enormous benefits. And we need to kind of keep an open mind as we usher in this new paradigm shift, which is going to take us places where we don't quite know where we're going, but it's kind of fun to be along for the ride, and I hope by having these conversations we can shape it in ways that the unintended negative consequences are minimized compared to the benefits that we will reap from it. With that, I'd like to open it up to my colleague, Britton Heller, uh, who is a co-moderator, a co-organizer of this event, who unfortunately couldn't come to Kyoto, but hopefully she's there in from California and is able to join us. Britton? Yes, hello. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, Larry, are you able to hear me? We are able to hear you. Oh, that is incredible. Uh, thank you all for having me here today. Um, I'm, I'm Britton Heller. I am affiliated with Stanford University with the Cyber Policy Center and with, um, with the Atlantic Council as a senior non-resident fellow, um, fellow in the Digital Forensics Research Lab. My job today is to talk to you about several general issues and concerns related to artificial intelligence, um, in particular generative AI, that can lead to unintended negative consequences. I've, um, I've tried to make kind of a, a more general list as some of my colleagues that will follow after me will get more into specifics. But to kind of set the pessimist uh, scheme, first I'd like to call attention to ethical and bias concerns. Conversational AI systems such as chatbots can inadvertently propagate moral and ethical biases, potentially eroding trust and leading to public dissatisfaction. Next, there can be a potential lack of accountability. In environments where it could be difficult to authenticate content or indicate provenance, or spaces that may lack proper accountability or authentication mechanisms, AI systems may lead to avoidance of responsibility for harms, resulting in biased or even misleading AI products. Next, we have malware and cybersecurity risks. AI applications can become vehicles for malware, posing substantial cybersecurity risks. Malicious AI can compromise systems, damage critical infrastructure, or disseminate false information. We should also be aware of foreign interference. State actors may exploit generative AI for disruptive purposes, revealing the susceptibility of AI systems to foreign manipulation and emphasizing the need for robust security measures. This can also be a measure of disinformation on a domestic front as well. Related to that are concerns about synthetic media and deep fakes. The proliferation of AI-generated multimodal content, like synthetic audio and video content, can make it difficult to distinguish genu genuine media from manipulated media, undermining our trust in digital content. We should also be concerned about user vulnerabilities. Users who rely on AI for information and decision-making may be susceptible to misinformation and manipulation or exploitation by malicious actors. Social and economic impact can also come from generative AI. AI-related crises can have profound social and economic consequences, impacting public safety, causing panic, and disrupting critical services. There can be wider international implications from generative AI. The involvement of international partners in AI-related issues and in the war over the hardware and infrastructure needed to produce generative AI can have diplomatic and geopolitical implications, necessitating international cooperation to address AI-related threats. This can be challenging. Finally, we can look to extremism and disinformation as the last potential threat. AI can be leveraged by extremist groups to disseminate disinformation potentially inciting social and political unrest. In response to these challenges, all types of stakeholders should prioritize responsible AI development, robust cybersecurity measures, 
and establish clear accountability mechanisms while promoting international cooperation. Addressing these concerns is crucial to mitigate the potential issues and risks associated with AI in national security, statecraft, and information dissemination. That is my doom and gloom summary. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to discussing this further. Well, you got us off to a rollicking start here. Um, I'm not sure whether to crawl under the table yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll stick with it at least through the session. Uh, our next speaker is Daniel Castaño, who joined us remotely, I believe from Colombia. And Daniel, would you mind introducing yourself briefly before your remarks? Daniel? Hola. I know he's there because he responded. Um, while Daniel sorts out his uh, whatever's going on, I'm going to skip him for, for a moment and go to Janice Richardson. And Janice, if you would briefly introduce yourself and your thoughts, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I'm an educator, but I also studied law, technology, and instructional design. And you can see how they all come together in the topic we're talking about. About 30, 40% of my work is for the Council of Europe. And I think it's very important to tell you that on the 29th of September, all of the member states of the Council of Europe agreed on a resolution to develop a legal instrument to shape to control in a way or to master the way that AI is being used in education. AI has a lot of advantages for education, or it could have. For example, more personalized learning, overcoming many of the physical and other access barriers, giving learners database feedback, giving a teacher a better overview of vulnerabilities, reducing the skill gap, and providing personalized, personalized, I say, between inverted commas, assistance. It does allow for much more exploration, creation of smart content, and of course, we can't overlook the automation of repetitive tasks. But I think that my concerns are wrapped up in the words of UNICEF, the definition which now has become the definition of the OECD. This definition, AI refers to machine-based systems that can, that can, given a set of human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions that influence real or virtual environments. And there you see many of my concerns. Who are the humans who are defining the objectives? How can one make predictions when generative AI learns? But maybe I'm very, very different from other people. Pluris pluralism, where is it? Will it really be taken into account? And why should generative AI or any other sort of machine make decisions that could influence the real or virtual environment that I move in. We're also, you see in this definition, AI systems interact with us, but where is the human? They act on our environment, either directly or indirectly. Often they appear to operate autonomously, and they can adapt their behavior by learning about the context. All of these things give me a lot of concern. At the Council of Europe, I work in digital citizenship education, which I think is an extremely important area of education. We are citizens, all of us, nowadays, mainly of this online world. And we do need to know the impact that the environment is having on us and the impact that we are having on the environment. If I look at the first cluster of domains that we work with in the Council of Europe, as access and inclusion, you can imagine all of the difficulties of those people who don't have access to this. 
I think that we're digging that digital divide even deeper. Then, when we look at well-being, which is the second set of clusters in the digital citizenship education model, do we really need more technology in our lives? Do we need someone, when I decide that I want to go to Japan, for instance, and I log in to ChatGPT or Bard or another, and it tells me you can go here and you can do this and this, but who is behind it? Who is giving that data? Which databases are being used? There is just not enough transparency for us to understand who would be guiding these decisions. And finally, rights, participation. Are we really actors in our own society? Do we really have democracy? Because the three underpinning elements of the Council of Europe are democracy, rights, human rights, and rule of law. And this really raises questions for me. We've seen in enough el national elections the impact that technology has had. Won't this give technology an even greater impact? Consumer awareness is another domain in the DCE model. But what is generative AI going to do for consumers? Is it going to help them? Or is it going to lead them in front of just too many opportunities? I read an interesting comparison recently. Looking at George Orwell, 1984, Aldous Huxley, War of the Worlds. Whereas Orwell was scared that we wouldn't have freedom in what we could read, that there would be boundaries placed around us. Aldous Huxley was scared that we wouldn't know how to read, that we wouldn't be reading anymore, and that we would be inundated with inf information to such an extent that it became meaningless. These are my fears. Back to you. Okay, another bright, cheery uh, set of comments, but very good questions, questions that we do need to address. And speaking of that, I believe Daniel is now back online, so Daniel, take it away, if you would. Hey, Larry, Great. thank you very much. Because I'm here, we just have a, a little bit of a technical issue. Uh, we're all set. So I'm Daniel Castaño. I'm based in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, I'm a professor of law, and I'm also a consultant working around these topics uh, with different local and international companies. Um, so as we convene uh, for this year's IFG, we are at a pivotal moment in the evolution of our digital landscape. Central to our discussion is the transformative power of generative AI, a technology with profound implications for our global society. So this is not only something to generate you know, a poem, to write an essay, or to try to come up with a new diet. This is really a life-changing technology. Firstly, we must ponder upon the role of our legislators administrative agencies and judiciaries. And here we might ask ourselves, how can they anchor the development and deployment of generative AI in ethics, especially when this technology has the potential to mold public policy and influence societal norms. Secondly, with the great power comes great responsibility. As generative AI presents avenues for misuse, well protective measures and regulatory frameworks should win state, particularly when our concerns in safeguarding of our critical public sector domains. So here uh, we it begs the question whether current um, frameworks that have been developed around the globe for AI in general terms, it is um, appropriate to regulate generative AI too. Furthermore, the discourse around AI is not solely for experts, and this is very important. It's imperative that we bridge the understanding between AI specialists and the larger public. How can we dispel myths and foster a well-informed public view rather than allowing misconceptions or fear to cloud judgment? So we have been experiencing this in Latin America where we don't have a, a strong scientific basis 
uh, upon which we can ground these debates. So mostly what we have today is just speculation and taking foreign uh, policies and try to translate them to our, to our, into our languages or with few adjustments. So lastly, we cannot overlook the borderless nature of AI innovation. In an interconnected world, how can we cultivate international cooperation? Let's envision platforms that encourages shared best practices and harmonizes strategies to address the intricate challenges posed by generative AI. So this is very important uh, for my region, for Latin America. First, we need to bridge the technological gap. We need to improve education. We need to improve access to this technology so that we can really have a grasp of it. And based on this, we can have an informed conversation and we can actively participate in shaping the global conversation around these new technologies. Thank you, and I'm very looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Daniel. And uh, Zoe, I think you're having a little technical issue here. Did you get the fault? Yeah, um, uh, the host has disabled screen sharing, but I have some slides, so maybe we can just uh, quickly fix that. And while we're doing that, um, I just want to start by saying maybe we should set a baseline for what Gen AI is and what Gen AI isn't. So um, uh, first of all, I'm Zoe Darme, uh, and just want to, uh, everybody should just give themselves a round of applause for making it through IGF. You are the diehards. You are here. It is now 3.09 on the last day of IGF, so well done, all of us. Um, and uh, as we figure out screen share, uh, one thing I want to mention is that generative AI models are not information databases. They're not deterministic information retrieval systems. Uh, they are probabilistic. So it's not like a search engine. I work on search. It's not like you're searching. You put in a, a query and then, uh, and then the model is like searching a large corpus of data and pulling something from the corpus. Um, they are predicting, essentially, I've heard it described by a few people earlier, um, including like Nick Clegg has said this, I've heard this from others. It's sort of like um, uh, autocomplete on steroids. It's really predicting the next set of words that are likely to come next. So just wanted to set that out as the way that generative AI models um, run. Now, what I'm gonna take you through, oh, no, you can share on your screen. Maybe someone can make me a host. I don't know if the Secretariat can do that. Can you make Zoe a host so she can share? We're working on that. But, but yeah, while we're ahead. doing that, um, I'm going to go over a couple of ways that we're thinking through generative AI and misinformation, generative AI and the information uh, ecosystem. Uh, and um, so as at the risk of aging myself as a child of the 90s, can I just see a show of hands of how many people remember tips like watch out for misspellings or check for check for um, suspicious links? Just quick show of hands. Who, who saw that, right? Okay. So um, that was when we uh, all kind of first signed up for email. But we're seeing something kind of similar today. Uh, and it's not about spam and phishing, but it's really about whether a given piece of content was AI generated. So uh, what are people saying now? They're saying, ooh, look for weird fingers, right? Or um, look for overly smooth contours in an image. Um, and I think it's reasonable that people want shortcuts, right? We're busy people. They want easy heuristics to figure out whether something is trustworthy or not uh, because we're busy people. But we can really end up in some traps here. Uh, and so I did have a slide that gave you one example, which is digging into one thing that we hear a lot is like check for shadows, as if we're all shadow experts in visual literacy experts. Uh, and there's a famous photo, I don't know who's seen the photo of um, Lee Harvey Oswald standing in his backyard holding a rifle and, uh, and communist newspapers. So very famous photo. And ever since this photo was first released, conspiracy theories have swirled around it. They say, no way can there be a shadow pointing down on his nose, but like to the, to the back and sideways um, um, from behind. Uh, and so um, 
there have been a number of uh, studies that have been done to debunk this. Uh, and most recently, uh, Hani Farid, Dr. Hani Farid, uh, actually led a team of uh, researchers who, uh, who, who, who debunked this once again. And Hani Farid is a world famous expert in computer science, right? And imagery, he's the father of photo DNA. He's not your average human, and yet we're asking, or average user, I should say, not average human, average user, and we're, yet we're asking average users to do something that actually takes a lot of compute power to do. And so what my point here is uh, that these heuristics, these shortcuts that, we're, that we hear, you know, top five tips to spot a fake are not 100% reliable and neither are they durable, right? Because we know that spammers learned how to use spell check. They, knew, they figured out how to buy .org domains. And AI over time will learn how to figure out to create a picture of a human with five fingers. That's just gonna happen. Mark Zuckerberg already has legs in the metaverse. So, um, so what we need to do is figure out uh, how we adapt our information literacy best practices that we've honed over the years um, to really work uh, in this landscape of generative AI. My screen sharing is working. Look, we're already technical experts uh, here at IGF. So I'm gonna give you a really quick quiz. Uh, and I want you to grade yourself. Uh, Janice is an educator, so you will, you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, what do you call it when you're administering a, a test? Proctor, you can proctor for us. So very quickly, uh, just in your head, right, think, you know, okay, which one of these has not been created with AI, A or B? I'm gonna give you 10 seconds, because that's usually our attention span online. All right. Now, which one of these photos is more or less as it's described? Both purporting to be about climate change, for example. Okay, and then lastly, which one of these is a real product? <laughs> and the caption says, uh, 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 for those of us who, who don't read this, is spicy chicken wings flavor. Okay, so you, uh, you've, I, I expect you all to grade yourself. Uh, for quiz number one, uh, the Curvy House uh, is actually a real place. The other one is um, generative AI art. Uh, for the second one, it's actually the photo from WWF, which is misleading. This is actually a cropped photo from the same, it's, it's the same photo, it's actually not from a different year. Uh, and, you know, uh, heaven help us, uh, spicy chicken wing Oreo was a real thing. I did not eat them. So how many here of you got 100% of these correct? Congratulations. I see two hands. Okay. So are, does that mean we are all, uh, well, what does that mean? So uh, there were a bunch of researchers at the Australian National University who inspired this quiz. They gave a very similar test, and they actually studied people's eye movements. And what they found is that, like us <laughs> in this room, people aren't actually that great uh, at being able to tell whether a given image is manipulated or not. And mean accuracy rate was about a little bit better than a coin toss. And moreover, by tracking their eye movies, movements, they could tell that people were not able to focus on what was salient in the image, what was manipulated or not. So, um, we know that our information literacy tactics have to evolve, and they especially have to do so to prepare for more generated content. But the question, is this AI, is not the same question as, is this trustworthy? And we are seeing so much conflation of these two questions. So here, on the, uh, this image on the left is uh, non-AI generated. It's supposed to be of trash left by climate activists in Hyde Park. Does anybody know what this really was? It was a 420 celebration. So it makes a lot more sense that this is from uh, the aftermath of a weed smoking uh, convening rather than some claim about the hypocrisy of climate change activists. Now, the image uh, in the middle here is one that I put into an image generator saying, you know, um, 
uh, art of Hyde Park London with trash. Now, which one is trustworthy here and which one is not? The context really matters. So mis and disinfo can happen with generated images. I'm not denying that it can't. But what I'm saying is it can also happen with plain old vanilla taken out of context images. Sometimes real and trustworthy map onto each other and sometimes they don't. And so because of these complexities, we're going to need multiple tools in the toolbox, some combination of both assertive and inferred provenance. So I'm not going to go over the differences between the two of these, and we have a lot of inferred provenance tools in Google Search. Um, but what I'm going to share right before I close is some early research on assertive provenance. And so, uh, what we did was a study with about 8,000 participants and we showed them an image with one of three labels. We asked them a question about their interpretation of what the label meant, their confidence in the accuracy of that label and how trustworthy that label content seemed to be. And what we found is that comprehension really varied by the label and it was the lowest for unlabeled content. Moreover, 14% of participants totally misinterpreted the meaning of a piece of content having no label. So the correct interpretation is that no label means we don't know. But these participants met, uh, thought that that meant that the image was not changed at all. And so here we have to talk about the implied truth effect. So this is a phenomenon where when some content is labeled as false, users some users can infer that unlabeled content is true. And we actually tested this. We presented respondents first with labeled content, asked them how trustworthy they thought it was, uh, and then uh, we showed them unlabeled content. And some got labeled content first and un unlabeled content second, some got unlabeled content first and uh, labeled content second. And the TLDR here is that the presence of an AI label on some content seemed to make unlabeled content more trustworthy in the eyes of participants. So what does this mean? It means that, uh, it doesn't mean that I think that labels are necessarily bad. But I think we really are always like very quick to say, uh, this is a technology problem, it needs a technology solution. Uh, and actually what we really need are multiple different types of tools in the toolbox. So we need better information literacy, we may need labeling as well, um, but we need uh, also inferred provenance tools like we have through about this result and other features. Uh, because we don't want to inadvertently increase user misperceptions by over relying on any one tool. So there are no silver bullets, misinfo is sticky, it moves fast, people have low attention spans, but at the same time we have to craft messages that appeal to all and will actually get read. So finally, the last thing I'm going to say is um, one of my engineers said, I've been hearing a lot of questions and to me it all sounds like how can I trust steel if you can make it into a sword? And I think that's how a lot of people are approaching generative AI. Um, so thank you very much uh, and I'll pass it back to you, Larry. Yeah, thank you. And I guess a general question I have for the panel, and I'm going to start with Britain since she was the one who started us off this road of uh, negativity. No offense, Britain is a good friend of mine, and I know for a fact, Britain, you're a very positive person in your real life. So let's talk a little bit about possible solutions. What can we do to mitigate the, the unintended consequences or perhaps even intended consequences from some people that you talked about in, in your introduction? One of the, the best things I, I think we can do, and one that we are well situated to do at IGF, is to try to take more of a global perspective on these problems. This is part of my personal bias since I'm an international law professor. And I tend to look at certain types of governance regimes that are built on global participation and international consensus has as having more validity and because they, they have wider participation. There's, um, I think the point that's been brought up about AI unintentionally furthering the digital divide is a very salient one. Right now, two billion people around the world do not have access to the internet and I think that 
working on some of the foundational access related issues to get everybody as level as we can before we move one click forward beyond the internet into what comes next would be um, a, a very a very useful step so creating schemes where schemas where international voices can be heard and valued and allowing the technological means so that international voices can have equal participation. Thank you. And Daniel, you're um, speaking of international voices. You're the one representative from the Global South on this panel. What's your perspective in terms of the, of the comment Britain made about the haves and have not of technology and how generative AI is going to affect people outside of you know, Europe and the United States and some of the more wealthy countries? Uh, well, that's actually a, a very interesting question. Thanks for that. I would like to elaborate more on what Britain mentioned about the digital divide. I would say that's the biggest challenge for our region, for Latin America, in terms of education. So first, we actually do not have the curriculum. We don't have undergraduate programs, we don't have enough graduate programs, we're not producing enough people uh, that are working around these topics. And that's a big problem because that means that we don't have access to this knowledge. Uh, our companies, local companies don't, don't have access to this knowledge and our governments don't have access to this knowledge either. So with that being said, I think it's very hard to even start having a conversation on how we can uh, regulate, how we can govern generative AI. And second, I will say infrastructure. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges. We have access to one of, you know, a few models that have been released lately. Uh, but I can see in the future that that's going to deepen the digital divide in terms that some people might have access to the free version, whereas other ones are going to have access to the paid version with new or more specific features. That's going to deepen the digital divide um, in our region. And I think that's already happening well, when it comes to the access, for example, to, to ChatGPT and to Cloud. We just had access to Anthropic's Cloud 2 last week. Uh, when it was released three months ago. So um, I can see that the big challenge is around bridging the, di the digital divide and just uh, bringing us into this conversation, not only by giving us paper, because that's, that, that's, that's what we've been getting. You know, we have this declaration of principles, recommendations and so on, that's very important, but we need to ha actually have access to this technology. So I would say, the best way to start is by is by helping Latam like get uh, that education and, and that infrastructure that we need. Janice, as you said, you're an educator, and even though you're based in Europe, I happen to know you do a lot of work all over the world, including Africa and other other continents. But I wanted to especially focus on the comment um, or the what Zoe had indicated about how difficult it is, even for people in this room to know right from wrong, real from fake, because we talk a lot about critical thinking. And I suspect everybody in this room is probably a pretty good critical thinker, yet with a couple of exceptions, most of us got that wrong, or at least partially wrong, despite our critical thinking skills. So I'm curious, from your perspective as an educator, how can we begin to educate the world to be critical thinkers in this technology that even people in this room, many of whom are experts, are having trouble grasping? So, yeah, it's an extremely important question, but I think we're going around it the wrong way. Because creativity, it's sort of the elephant in the room here. Creativity is reducing all the time. About seven years ago, 4% of the activities young people were doing online were creative activities. Now it's getting even less. And yet, if you know how to create these pictures, if you know how to create, how to write, then you are much more discerning in what you see the information brought to you. 
So I'd say, first of all, push creativity so that we really become creators and not consumers. And I think we'll see a difference there. And this counts for all the countries I work in, in Africa, in Asia, young people are not creating. The second thing is teachers have never been taught in most countries, even including Europe and America, about how to develop critical thinking. Teacher training institutions have not really changed their agenda or their cursus to bring this into the training. So I think it's very important that our educators are educated, get a, a much bigger opportunity um, to know how to develop critical thinking. Now, putting kids in front of videos from the age of two or three is not the way to do it. We are getting so many fast-moving images and sounds. We're developing the lateral lobes of our brain. And we're totally forgetting the prefrontal lobe, which is the one that we have to use to be criti critical thinkers. So I think there, I've got three different approaches, how to develop critical thinking. Well, teacher training, more creativity, and thinking what we're doing to our kids when we sit them in front of all of those videos. Okay, before I turn to Zoe, I want to make a comment, more or less in response to Janice. Uh, when it comes to the issue of creativity, I mean, I personally write, I'm a writer, which is a creative endeavor, and I have found that tools like BARD and ChatGPT and Bing are incredibly powerful in helping me generate ideas, do my research, but at the, and actually enhance my creativity that in fact I feel more creative as a result of being able to use these tools. The only challenge that I have is that I have to go out of my way to make sure that I don't plagiarize these tools and I use them as, as background information as opposed to content generation. But that's me and that's now. And I guess the question I have for Zoe is looking forward as these things get better and better and better, will that in fact make, it even, make even the most creative people redundant? Um, so I am not a software engineer. I am uh, a, an English PhD dropout, so I like to pretend that uh, I still am creative. The way that I use some of these tools is to automate some of the more, most mundane tasks. So oh, I have to recycle the set of TPs or craft this into a vision statement, you know, someone's asked me to do. And it, that frees me up to have more of my own creative free time where I'm painting, where I'm reading, where I'm doing the things uh, that I like to do in, um, on my own time. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm not actually that worried about it. We are incredibly curious humans. One stat about search, I work on search, is that 15% of all searches are new. Now, a lot of that's misspellings, but a lot of that just shows like the limitless nature of human curiosity. So I'm, I'm very bullish on how, how creative, how curious we will continue to be. Um, so does that answer your question, Larry? It, it begins to. And in fact, my theory is that, that if, any, if chat GPT or BARD or any of these tools is going to replace people, it's the people who are not particularly good at their game. I mean, I, I suspect, you know, if you're a hack writer putting out press releases based on, you know, you know or, or just trying to regurgitate stock prices and things like that, you may wind up being redundant. But I, I doubt very much whether it's going to uh, replace people who are highly creative. But, you know, that remains to be seen. Yeah, the way that I would think about this is, do I think that generative AI could have created, for example, John Coltrane's Giant Steps? The reason that Giant Steps or the Tristan Chord is so memorable in the pantheon of music history is because they were so path-breaking. Whereas a lot of these models, as I mentioned earlier, are probabilistic. So they're taking the tra training data and they're guessing which is the likely set of words to come next. And if you're doing that, how likely are you going to be the next Milton, the next Shakespeare, what makes them great is that they're so radically different from what came before. Okay, so I'm gonna hopefully reserve a little bit of time for everybody to do a quick wrap up, but I wanna open it up to the audience, both here in, where are we? Here in uh, Kyoto, as well as around the world. 
uh, for any questions or comments. So the floor is open. There are microphones in the room. And I believe with Britain, you're the online moderator. Are we going to be doing chat or how are we going to get input from the remote audience? We are going to be doing chat earlier on. Uh, we asked the online audience if they had any questions to please put them in the chat. Uh, one question that I think we can start with um, comes from our colleague in Afghanistan who asks, uh, who, who states that generative AI is fantastic for developing education systems um, in developing countries, but digital culture and plagiarism remain big issues. What is the best way to cultivate generative AI in these circumstances? So we're talking about plagiarism, which is, of course, a, always an issue, has been an issue long before computers, let alone generative AI. Uh, Madam Educator, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I certainly do. When I was lecturing at the Sorbonne University back in the 90s, and I allowed my law students to bring one book into their final exams, the other educators, the other lecturers said, what, how can you do this? And I said, it's easy. I asked them a question where they apply their knowledge. They can't find it in a book. They have to find different bits of knowledge in their own head. And if they know their book well enough to find the specific knowledge, good on them, because no lawyer will ever settle a case without having dozens of books. So this is pretty much my answer. Give kids questions where they apply their knowledge, where they're not going to find a ready-made answer, and if they do, a teacher is going to be able to see through it. So it just means that the educators have to think much more uh, much more strategically than what they had to. Yes, but I am concerned, and Zoe, perhaps you can address this, about the fact that these tools currently typically don't cite their sources. So, for example, if I were to ask a question into one of the popular chatbots, whatever you want to call it, I'm going to get an answer, but I don't know where that answer came from. And so if I rely on that answer, am I inadvertently plagiarizing? And if so, what can we do about that? So one of the things that we just added to BARD is um, the double check feature. So if you ask it for a prompt, uh, you know, like uh, oh, <laughs> give me an essay on John Col Coltrane's Giant Steps, for example, it will, output, uh, it will output a response. And then you can actually double, you, it's hooked up essentially to search so that you can um, highlight one of the sentences or part of a sentence and uh, click on it and it'll take you to the search results that will, um, uh, that will cover the same issue. And, uh, and so I think that's, we're getting better and better uh, at so rapidly with these models, but I think innovations like that will really help over time. And uh, with the gentleman right there, would you introduce yourself and then ask your question and make your comment? Surely. Uh, uh, my name's Andrew Campling. Um, I have the privilege of working on the intersection of internet standards, security, uh, and privacy um, for, uh, on the whole. Um, I'm also a trustee of the Internet Watch Foundation, so to uh, continue the gloomy tone, um, and then I'll ask a question. Um, major concern that I have, um, uh, we're already seeing AI-generated CSAM. Um, it, uh, helpfully in the UK, doesn't matter if it's AI generated, it's still illegal, but that's not true in all jurisdictions. Um, uh, uh, it raises issues because it may not be based on a real human, so there's a risk if you can't tell that it's not real, that you might look for a victim to try and you know, uh, rescue them from the, the, the abuse, but they may not exist, so you can waste resources if you can't detect that, that it's unreal. Um, the, the, the other issue it raises, and I'll try and word this delicately, um, you can, in the prompts that you, you give to generate the uh, uh, imagery, um, you can ensure that the victim that's being portrayed is enjoying their experience, which wouldn't happen in real life, but that actually then creates more issues for the people that consume uh, that uh, you know, horrible content. Um, that also, there's a trade in prompts that bypass the guardrails in the, in the various closed platforms. 
um, but also where, where you have open platforms, um, they're very popular for the people that generate this illegal content because that means they can download them and sort of play with different prompts in the in knowing that they won't be found out because uh, it's on their system rather than uh, on a closed system. So um, yeah, it's it's a real concern and, and and it's getting worse as the image generation becomes more photorealistic. Uh, so I raise that uh, the question. Uh, though, which is sort of unrelated to that, but I think it might be useful. Um, given the potential for generative AI to poison the global uh, data pool, um, should the precautionary principle be applied to the development and use of generative AI? i um, be interested in your thoughts on that as well. Before I turn that question over to my colleagues, I just want to comment. Um, I'm not an expert on CSAM, but I did serve on the NECMEC, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's Board, for 20 years, and it's important to understand that among the various evils of CSAM, one, of course, is the exploitation of a real child, which may not be the case with generative AI, but the other is the normalization of sexual exploitation of children and the grooming of children, um, and that actually is a risk that obviously needs to be considered. And as far as I remember, and perhaps the lawyers in the room can correct me, the U.S. Supreme Court does allow artificially generated uh, images of, of child sexuality, I believe, um, and I know there's been a lot of controversy about that, so that is a, something I think that we'll have to be looked at. But in terms of your other question, um, do you guys have a grasp on that, or do we need to have him restate it? Would you mind re quickly restating your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, I got off on a tangent. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so it's should we apply the precautionary principle to the development and use of generative AI because of the risk of it poisoning the global data pool? Because if we find out in the future that it's caused a problem, it will be too late to fix it. Um, so I think this is an issue where we shouldn't allow the, the regulation to follow the technology. I'd argue it probably should be the other way around because there's no going back. So it's not to discriminate against our friends abroad. Uh, do either of our remote participants want to address that before I open it up to the panel here in Kyoto? Okay, well, Jennifer, you had a comment? I can only agree with you, not only for this reason, but for many others. This is why we are looking at developing an instrument at the Council of Europe a little bit like the Lanzarote Convention for the child sexual abuse that you're talking about. So we need to take precautions. I've been reading lot, a lot about autophagy also when generative AI uses generated material until it reaches a sort of an incestuous point where the, the content is incomprehensible. So yes the precautionary principle, please. One thing I will point out, I, I said to Larry at the beginning, okay, you want you want a slides on misinfo or you want slides on, on gender? And it was hard to decide. But one thing that I'll mention uh, the, on, the, on the gender slides is that we're actually using large language models to uh, make Google search safer in a couple of ways. So one example is we're using a model called BERT to reduce over-sexualization of neutral queries uh, by 30%. So let's say you're searching for something like um, uh, 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 the, the query amateur, which in and of itself is neutral, or uh, Latina teenager, for example, or le chef lesbien. Uh, we are now better able to return uh, neutral, non-explicit queries because we're using uh, BERT, and the last T stands for transformers, which is the same T in uh, GPT. We're also using a model called MUM to help us better detect uh, suicide-seeking queries, especially ones that are not overtly and explicit, something like, uh, you know, uh, ways to commit suicide. They can be more subtle, like, will six stories killed me with stories misspelled? Uh, and so now, because we are using the same technology to better detect 
those types of queries, we're better able to trigger uh, our, 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 our resources for help, which in the UK um, uh, includes the Samaritans. So I think regulation is needed. I think guardrails are needed. I would like to see the ability to continue using these innovations for safety as well. Thank you. And we have a gentleman, I think, wants to make a statement or ask a question. Yes, my name is uh, Julius Endert from Deutsche Welle Academy, uh, German public broadcaster. Um, so and my question is, I'm I asking myself, why are you doing this little test with, with us? Um, because I also <laughs> find it misleading, because um, it gives us the, the illusion that we will be able uh, to decide what, what's real, what's not real in the future. And I think this is this will not be the fact anymore, and, uh, and uh, uh, the case anymore. And I also think that this is not what we can do uh, and what we are made for as human and how we uh, perceive our environment. And for me, it means that everything I see di digital is by default. I, I need it, and this is also the message you, you, you give us, is by default wrong, because maybe I can detect a, a picture from right or wrong, and maybe it is made up by Photoshop and, and not by AI, but when it comes to text or, or, or any other form of media or audio, uh, how, how, how should I detect a, a, a fake audio of your voice with a generated text in my podcast? So this <laughs> for, for this, it, it, it means for me this, we are moving to, uh, to a, a post-factual world online, and I, I don't know if you have any idea how to yeah, how to, to, to protect our society and or maybe maybe the question is too big or our democracy if, if everything what I see online, what I hear online could be generated. And, and I think it's remarkable that, that the, the actors in the US are the first who, who understand this, that they can be, um, that, that, that they are needed uh, uh, any longer in the future because everything can be synthesized from their voice, from the scripts and even uh, even visually. So maybe it's, all, it's more a statement, but... Well, that's a big question. Zoe, you were the one who asked the quiz, but I think it's just in general that is a very big issue. I mean, I think it, it gets down to that issue of trust. You know, how does one authenticate and how does one have trusted agents that can authenticate? And I know that Google and Microsoft and a lot of companies are working on ways to authenticate the the reality of, of different things, but there's no question that the, that the issues you raise are real. Uh, we're almost out of time. Um, we actually are technically out of time. Do we, do we have another, it doesn't look like we have anybody rushing in to come into the room, so let me uh, say one quick, or maybe even two qu very quick comments from the audience, and then we're gonna have to wrap up. Okay, thank you very much. I'm uh, current, uh, my name is Valerie Skanevs. I'm currently the master degree student here in the KCJ in Kyoto. So my question is regarding the future and prospects of the generative AI. So as we all know that currently we're feeding a lot of data into the models and we get those predictions and based on that we get the generated text or imagery. My question is if we gonna feed the models even more because we're gonna filter and sort data and we're gonna get generated more data and it's being generated every single year. So will the models become more uh, precise in determining what is going to be generated? I mean, like, will we be at the point when the human creativity and the model creativity will be on the par? Thank you. Is that a yes or no answer? <laughs> I would say probably. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, just a quick point about the precautionary principle. The cat is already out of the bag, or let's say the llama is out of the bag, because you can run these models on your own PC. And I predict here that within two years, it will be easy enough to teach them even that the graph, let's say a typical 10-year-old kid can be doing their own models on their own PCs. And it's completely hopeless to try to prevent that. And another point is that there are other type of AI systems, and when those start mixing with a predictive generative AI, think of uh, AlphaGo, which invented Go strategies that no human being had ever thought of. You can't still combine them, computer power isn't enough, but when that happens, then we are starting to get really interesting things.
But what I really worry about is the system context. If you can generate them on your own machine on your home, there's no way nobody can detect that, really. They don't travel on the internet, nothing. Well, on that bright note, thank you. Uh, if it'll make you feel any better, or perhaps a lot worse, even without AI, we've managed to convince more than 30% of Americans that the person who didn't win our last election, in fact, won our, won our last election. So it doesn't take AI to you know, create a lot of false information that people are willing to believe. Very l quick last comments from our panel. Let's start with the remote. Britain, do you have anything to say to wrap up? Thank you all for having me here today. It's It's been very interesting. I think what I've taken away from this panel is uh, that this may be a technological problem, but it may have human solutions. And that's something that I think ends as on a note of optimism. I appreciate that. Uh, Daniel? Is he still with us? Yep, I'm here. Well, Great. thank you all for having me here too. Um, what I take here is that we need to work a lot on just putting everyone on the same page when it comes to technical literacy and, you know, uh, having the human rights discourse, discourse is our guide. So thank you. Thank you all for having me. Everyone. Janice? Yes, I think we've covered some very interesting questions. I sort of feel like we've opened a Pandora do a box. You have reinforced me in my mission to go out and educate and really strive for democracy. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Janice. Zoe. Um, I think the last thing I want to mention is I cut some slides around inferred provenance, but I think that has to be part of the solution. We're really a lot of times focusing on what can you do? Can you put watermarks in? Can you put labels on? Can you put something in meta tags? You know, um, but we're adding more and more new features directly into the search results page to make it easier for people who want to engage in best practices like lateral reading. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to question everything, but you should question claims. And it's really not about the content itself, but the claim associated with it. Uh, and um, one of the tools that we have is called About This Page, where you can learn more about what others say about a given source. Uh, and we also, earlier this year, announced About This Image, which will also make it easier uh, uh, to search, to essentially do um, better and more enhanced reverse image search. So thanks, Larry. So at the risk of plagiarizing and not being able to cite a source, someone yesterday in one of the sessions brilliantly said, we want to teach people to be curious but not cynical. And I think that's an important part of, I think, takeaway from what you said and what you said, Janice. Thank you guys very much for, for being here. We really appreciate it. And enjoy what's left of uh, IGF in your trip home or wherever you're going. <laughs>